And again, I think it's, we're on a holding pattern. And I think new vaccines will be developed that, that can, can uh, immu- immunize birds for life. I mean, that's, that's what yeah. we're hoping for. Welcome to the Poultry Podcast Show. Today, I'm here with Dr. Joseph Giambrone. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you so much. I, I'm excited to have you here today. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about avian influenza and specifically vaccination. And this is a really, really timely uh, time to have this podcast. So I'm very excited to hear what you have to say about this. So can you first tell us a little bit about how you got into chickens? Um, yes, I went to the University of Delaware to study marine biology because I wanted to be Jacques Cousteau. And I really liked uh, swimming and diving and fishing. Uh, so I went to the University of Delaware and to start in that program. And what I found out was the, the facility, Lewis Station, was way in the south of Delaware. And it was mainly geared towards graduate school and oceanography, neither one that I had interested in. So someone told me about animal and poultry science. I'd had a few farms that a uh, few friends had gone to have family farms, and I kind of liked them. So uh, I decided to transfer out of the marine biology to to the animal and poultry science. And when I was there, um, I took a course from a veterinarian uh, on poultry diseases. He graduated from the University of Georgia Veterinary School. And I really liked what he was doing and uh, took a course in virology and bacteriology. And so um, he said, in my senior year, would you like to work in my lab to do um, uh, a master's degree in poultry diseases? And I said, okay, it sounds good. And so I started the program. And the first one of the first things we did was work with um, surveillances on avian influenza. And that was 1972. So you go way, way, way back. And also we did some also work with some avian um, coronaviruses where I started doing some work with them coronaviruses way back before anyone had ever heard of them. So um, I finished up my work and then he said, well, you would like to go to the University of Georgia in the veterinary school to work and I can get you in there. So that's where I went. I, I did a lot of work there. They had an excellent lab. People were really, they had people from all over the world, great facilities. And then when I was ready to graduate, I looked at a number of universities. Um, the several that I had looked on were, um, a, a University of Arkansas, University of Massachusetts, and the University of Georgia. So I went to Georgia, and uh, it was really great. And so that when when I was ready to graduate, the, those were the ones I looked at. And then uh, I went to Auburn, and people were really friendly to me, and I decided to stay at Auburn. And I've been there uh, 45, 46 years still at Auburn. It's been really good. It worked out for me because they have a close relationship with the industry. And I continue to do work in industry. And we, we were able to get grants all the time to, over the years, to work with coronaviruses, which it causes disease, infectious bronchitis, and also with avian influenza and continued that work. And during that time, there had been an on and off with influenza. There'd go five, six years, no one cared about it. And then all of a sudden, there was an outbreak. And then all of a sudden, people cared, started having interest in it. So that's me. <laughs> oh, I I love that most people from that are in the poultry industry right now come from somewhere else. So it's it's really fun that everybody has a different outsider view. And yours, the marine biology man, that that is one of the most fun ones I think I've heard about so far. So right. <laughs> cool background. <laughs> I still like going out in the ocean. I still like uh, yeah. scuba diving, fishing. Uh, yeah. And, in Auburn, we have a really good um, aquaculture department. It's yeah. mainly freshwater. They don't do too much with saltwater. But I work with I work with them in uh, with fish diseases. It's kind of oh yeah, yeah. So can you kind of tell us about your your current role and what you've done since you've started at Auburn in terms of the the disease work that you're doing? Well, um, again, I my training is in virology and yeah. as I work with developing vaccines, uh, testing vaccines, did a lot of work with the pharmaceutical companies. When I first started at Auburn, there was maybe 12 pharmaceutical companies that make and culture vaccines. Now there are only four through con- yeah. con- uh, consultation. And so, um, yeah, um, 
We developed a lot of diagnostic tests like um, ELISA, antigen capture ELISA, real-time PCR, sequencing of viruses. A lot of my work has been through surveillance. With influenza, we've gone out to um, hunter killed uh, wildlife areas where the USDA comes uh, is in control of the birds going in and out. And they do samples, and they're continuing to do the samples with uh, determining, taking swabs from the cloaca and the throat to um, look for influenza viruses. And we've isolated yeah. over the years a number of influenza viruses. We've done sequencing, comparing them on the gen bank to other viruses. Luckily, over the years, we never found a, a highly pathogenic H5 or H7, which is the one that causes disease in mm -hmm. chickens. The ones that we've isolated are, are basically, um, they're just there all the time in wild birds. They don't have to do anything. So, uh, and, you know, we looked at developing some vaccines. At the time, we were looking at basically um, DNA vaccines. And it wasn't until after I retired that they started doing work with the RNA vaccines. Um, and, and, you know, we know the story with uh, coronavirus. So now yeah. making the, the recombinant viruses, you know, and, and uh, it's expanded. You know, it was only the last 15 years I started doing molecular work. The first mm -hmm. 30 years, they weren't really doing a lot of molecular work in virology, but then it all of a sudden changed uh, with recombinant DNA, RNA, with um, sequencing. I mean, you can isolate and identify a virus and sequence it within 24 hours. And yeah. it's even been heightened and sped up as a result of the coronavirus outbreak. Yeah, gosh, that's incredible. So maybe can you give us a little bit of background about how the the research or the vaccines have developed for avian influenza? Like maybe some of the things that are unique about it, and then uh, how what you've been doing to combat or to promote a a vaccine. Well. Um, for many, many years, there was always only killed vaccines. And you can make a killed vaccine uh, pretty easy by growing the virus up in eggs or cell culture, inactivating it, move it into a, put it into oil emulsion, uh, add an adjuvant and inject it. Um, and those worked really well for a long time. But the problem with the respiratory diseases is that you need to have some local immunity in the upper, in the, in the uh, heart area gland, which is behind the eye and the trachea. And the, the kill vaccines don't do a very good job of doing that. Uh, so from there came the live virus vaccines. The problem with influenza is that it is highly mutagenic. So you could develop a vaccine uh, in cell culture or um, eggs against the influenza virus that it could work really well, but unfortunately it could get back past the chickens and become virulent again. So that was out. And so <clears throat> it was only recently that uh, that the recombinant vaccines have been used. And uh, the ones that are out now, there's four of them, and they've been, you take the hemagglutin out of the, the Newcastle, I mean, the influenza mm -hmm. virus, and that's the one that causes the, as a result of pathogenicity and antigenicity. So, so that's where the business end of the virus is. So you mm -hmm. take that out, and right now the big problem is with the H5 uh, viruses. H7s and H9s have been in, uh, around for problems. So you take that and insert that into another vaccine, uh, viral vaccine, which is already being used in humans. I mean, in, in chickens. So there's a herpes virus of turkeys, which is a, a virus that's used to vaccinate chickens against Merrick's disease. So that far, the, so the hemoglobin has been in, uh, inserted into the, the HVT and then it's injected into the chicken. And not only it, it uh, prevents Merrick's, but, um, Influenza. The problem is with the, the if right now they're wanting to vaccinate turkeys, other wild bird, you know, other birds that are not chickens. Well, the HVT will only work in chicken. So then they have to go back and, and continue to use the inactivated ones. Uh, and with either one, you have to pick up the birds and inject them. And mm -hmm. and that you know, if you have small small birds, uh, zoo birds, other kind of birds like that. You can pick them up, but if you got millions of birds, and it's really difficult to do that. So the HPT is mainly used in a hatchery. It's given either mm -hmm. in ovo or injected subcutaneously. The good news about it is with chickens, it seems to continue to replicate for long periods of time. So it, and especially with broilers, you only have to vaccinate them one time. So mm -hmm. uh, theoretically, then you could vaccinate the chickens in ovo against uh, both Merix and uh, influenza, and then they would be they would be immune for their entire life. Uh, but uh, right now, the US 
VA has only um, approved one vaccine, and that's an inactivated v- vaccine, and that's used for California condors, which are, you know, mm. they are um, endangered. And they were getting infected with uh, the virus and were, in fact, dying. So um, there's still no, uh, in the U.S., no um, vaccines which are approved for avian influenza, mainly because of the, the possibility of embargo. And the broiler industry uh, right now is exporting about $5 billion worth of um, frozen leg quarters. And uh, mm-hmm. with the outbreaks we saw last year, um, luckily there was no influenza virus in the, um, in the, in the broiler belt in the, in the Southeast. So even though there were outbreaks in layers and turkeys in the Midwest, we didn't have too much of a problem with embargoing. So what's looking for now is the vaccination of uh, possibly in the future, we'll see, uh, of turkeys or possibly layers. And, but the, the problem is there, they don't know how long it's going to work. Um, mm-hmm. European studies have shown that it, it's fairly effective and it cuts down the viral shed. The inactivated vaccines don't cut down the viral shed, and that was the always problem. Well, um, the virus can still spread. It could get into broilers. It can have problems. So. USDA now is, is testing those, the, the, um, right now they're testing the SIVA product, the Boeinger product, as well as the Merck, uh, and Zoetis. Those are the four that are HPT. So we'll have to see how the USDA, um, it's the Center for, uh, uh, Vaccine Biologics are the ones that, that's part of the APHIS, which is part of the USDA. They control the use of vaccines in poultry. Mm-hmm. So we'll have to see where uh, they're going to go with that. Other countries have already in the world have already started vaccinating, uh, yeah. Or uh, and they're they're commercial poultry, but the U.S. will have to see. I mean, the outbreaks this year uh, in poultry are, are much less than they were last year, so um, we'll see whether they vaccinate or not vaccinate. But um, I think we have some good products now. It's just it's, mm-hmm. it's political will. It's uh, determine whether uh, we can vaccinate or not, um, and that that's. Uh, that goes back to the USDA and, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. So it sounds like the issues are mainly regulatory. Is there a concern that because the bird has been vaccinated, you don't know if it's a vaccine or a natural inoculation or are other countries worried about buying product that has active avian influenza in it? I mean, it sounds like it's probably multifunctional. <laughs> well, the products, the vaccines, which are out now, the recombinants mm-hmm. are diva products which means you can differentiate uh if you take an immune response from a chicken you can that's been vaccinated they will not have they will have immunity to the hemagglutinin but not the norimin uh, a viral a field virus will have the birds will get antibodies against the hemagglutinin and norimine so they are diva mm-hmm. the countries right now that are doing the vaccination most of them do not have a really significant export market uh, they don't have the government money to pay for the remuneration that to the, the farmers. So they cannot afford to, to pay the farmers that lose the chickens as a result of um, um, testing and slaughter. But in the U.S. now, we saw, we've saw we seen a lot of blowback from uh, various um, uh, groups like Humane Society, Society saying, why are you allowing these chickens not to be vaccinated? And then you're killing them uh, millions at a time. We don't think that's a good idea. And then the government itself is getting this blowback. You saw the um, the price the price of commercial eggs in the U.S. last year going up from about two dollars a dozen to almost eight dollars a dozen. And the consumer has you know dial into the, the the politician and say, hey, we don't want to pay that much when there's a vaccine out there. So um, yeah. the other thing is. And I read an article in, in indicated that APHIS doesn't have enough employees to get involved in the um, the slaughtering of, of uh, the poultry. And there's a problem there. And also there's a, I saw also there was a limited amount of this fire foam, which is the CO2, which is added to, uh, um, to, to kill the birds, euthanize the birds. And so there's, mm-hmm. you know, there's not a lot of that. And the other thing is in the middle of the winter, it gets so cold that actually using the CO2 uh, it won't function. I mean, we use uh, ventilation shutdown, but the problem with that is it doesn't kill all the birds. Uh, maybe kill 90, 95%. And so then you have to go in there to 
to euthanize the chickens in the cages with uh, the CO2 firefighting foam. And so if you don't have enough of that, you don't have enough APHIS workers, there's some problems with freezing, then you get into a problem, then what happens to these birds that aren't, um, that don't die in the cages? And, mm -hmm. you know, you've got as many as 5 million birds in, on, a, on a commercial egg laying operation. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's a logistical problem. Uh, it's a political problem. Uh, mm -hmm. It's political. And then you got the problem with the hem influenza viruses, in fact, infect humans. Although this, the last two years, there's only been a, a small handful of humans that have gotten sick from this H5N1, which is causing the, um, the outbreak. But you know, as we know before, the influenza virus is highly mutagenic. And so people are thinking for a long time, we thought like the, the next pandemic in humans would, caught, would come from influenza viruses, avian. Mm. So, so far that has not been the case. Uh, so yeah. you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very yeah. difficult situation and there's yeah. a lot of stakeholders and you would have that many stakeholders involved, you're gonna have uh, problems. Yeah, so as, as far as the vaccination schemes go, um, for anything that's respiratory, maybe a water or an aerosol might be the preferred method, but it just sounds like in this case, it might not be feasible in the operations so do you think that a single vaccination at the in ovo time point is sufficient? Or do you think we'll have to develop a protocol where there's in ovo and then the birds get a booster later in life, especially for the hens, you know, that might live right. like a lot longer? The, the problem with putting live vaccinations in the water again um, to get the immunity, it's it's a problem. Plus, like I said before, that live vaccines can, can back pass in chickens and become virulent. Yeah. Um, yeah. We know that the HVT virus for Merrick's, if you inject the chickens, mainly are getting ANOVA. They are immune to Merrick's the entire lifespan for okay. chickens. And the Merrick's virus is out there all the time. So the chickens are not, it's 99% effective. So mm -hmm. the duration of immunity to the influenza may, may or may not be the same as the HVT. You're assuming, you're assuming that the HVT keeps replicating. It will also replicate the hemoglobin which will mean that chickens will be immune for life. But those studies haven't been done. The studies that have been done in Europe and now being U.S. have not looked for birds, have not been able to, to check birds out till 60 weeks of age because the studies haven't been done long enough. So uh, th that would be the hope. I mean, layers and breeders are handled during their, the pullet stage for inactivated vaccines. So mm -hmm. it's not to say that you couldn't... Uh, pick the birds up and inject them, boost them with the HVT. The, I think the best thing would possibly look at putting the hemagglutin in a pox virus because the chickens then mm -hmm. are, are getting the pox uh, vaccines in the field. And so that pox virus also is a, one of those that can replicate for life. The other thing about the pox virus is the large genome. So you can put several viruses in there at the same mm -hmm. time. And uh, so you get uh, an extra added effect. But um I think the jury is out. I think, you know, France has already uh, ordered 80 million doses of the HVT um, hemagglutin, uh, the recombinant. And so they're just getting, they're supposed to get a start in the fall. So we'll have to see mm -hmm. where that goes. I think the U.S. is basically on a holding pattern. We're going to see how the rest of the world goes. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, the U.S., Brazil, Europe, and Thailand are the ones that are do most of the exploitation of of boiler meat. Uh, so far, Brazil has, these other countries have all had outbreaks in poultry. Brazil has only had some outbreaks in uh, wild uh, free-flying shorebirds. So they haven't been, haven't dealt with it, but all their neighbors have outbreaks in poultry. So it's only a matter of time. Uh, you know, it's one thing, well, if the whole world is vaccinating, then they can't embargo because they need the chicken. So yeah, it's a, uh, Again, I think it's, we're on a holding pattern, and I think new vaccines will be developed that that can can uh, immu immunize birds for life. I mean, that's that's what yeah. we're looking for. But you know, what bothered me a lot was these um, birds that uh, are rare and in danger. I mean, we could lose the wild, we could lose these wild uh, life because there's no way to vaccinate them if they're flying around. If they're in zoos and things like that, they can be vaccinated. And I don't see I don't see any I don't think anyone has a problem with vaccinating birds that uh, are in danger or, or in mm -hmm. zoos with either, uh, well, they'd have to, since they're not poultry, they'd have to be injected with an inactivated vaccine. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, uh, 
you know, even even people that are vegans or vegetarian want to see California condor same. Yeah. So as far as the exports go, what is the major concern for the vaccination? Like, it's not, I mean, it's political partly, but what is their major concern? Well, in the past, the vaccines didn't didn't have an effect on viral jet. They reduced mm-hmm. it, but they didn't completely eliminate it. And but the studies have been shown with frozen leg quarters that the virus, in fact, doesn't. It, you know, it doesn't. It inactiv- First off, it's inactivated during the processing part of it, mm-hmm. and uh, studies have been done actually uh, injecting the virus into frozen birds and keeping them for a certain period of time. And it, even that, you don't get a lot of virus out of it because it, obviously if the bird's frozen and you inject the virus, it can't replicate it, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I, think, I think it's all blown out of proportion. I don't, I don't foresee, you know, live birds, you know, the, the grandparent companies, you know, um, that are shipping chicks and eggs around the world, I, I can yeah. see that is a problem. But I can't see shipping uh, frozen leg quarters to countries uh, why they should embargo. I, you know, some of this has to do with the cost. Uh, you know, I've mm-hmm. shown in some of these other countries, even though they have influenza and they've had it all the time, they want to embargo the U.S., but then they say, okay, well, we'll take it, but we want it at a reduced cost. So it's mm-hmm. a business deal, right? And so there's no, you, you know, when you have, when you have influenza like Mexico and China and a lot of places in Asia and the, They've they've had um, influenza there for for eons, but yet mm-hmm. they're still wanting to embargo. And again, that that has to do with politics. It has business, you know. Try to say, okay, we'll take, yeah. it, but we we we're not going to pay you full price. Yeah, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I know that in the USDA, um, especially here in Iowa, where we, where we are, we've been getting better at the response and the order of a. Re- of response action items once a farm is identified to have avian influenza. Um, so if we look, if we look at what what we've learned in the last five years, are we getting better? Would you say at understanding and protecting the birds that are in the commercial setting and predicting these outbreaks, or do you think they're going to continue to just happen on a year by year basis? We'll have to just see because we didn't really have anything major this year, but last year it was pretty major. <laughs> Yes. Um, and again, that's, again, it's a way to see, you know, it's hard to know now whether we're doing a better job uh, with biosecurity or is there just less virus in the wildlife? And that, and so we, and that is true. There's less outbreaks that we've seen this year in wild birds. And the studies that have been done through genetics analysis of the virus indicates that last year, 80% of the virus uh, that were in wild birds ended up uh, in poultry. So what they're basically saying is the, the, the infections came from the wild birds. They didn't actually come from people bringing it into the farms or equipment. So, the, mm-hmm. so then it, and, and in, I think you and I talked about this before, putting some sort of filtration on the incoming mm-hmm. air through scrubbers and things like that. And, you know, we came to the conclusion it was expensive. Uh, but I think that's another thing that we could see. If, if you can protect the, uh, prevent the air coming in from wild birds, that'd certainly be important. But again, uh, keeping the wild birds out of the farm, uh, the circumference around the farm through not having any any water, uh, still water in the area, uh, feed spills and things of that nature. Uh, but there's no question that um, biosecurity is much, much better. And you know, I, I saw an article that was written by a professor who I know is she was saying that there was maybe or that the reason we're seeing less bars in the wild birds is they've developed immunity. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, and that could be, and that would be good. But the problem with that immunity is the virus changes. You've got immunity to this uh, clade of virus, but next year it could change. And then we have to go through that whole thing again. So, um, and, you know, that gets back to the, the virus now, you know, and when we talked about the, um, the coronaviruses, the variants, they're, they're typed according to the clade, which is basically the entire molecular structure. And the, the virus, which is out there now for influenza, is different from the one that was around several years ago. And so that's why they had to do the vaccine studies, because the vaccines were made from a virus that came uh, years before, an older clade. So, you know, it, the, for the coronaviruses now, the humans, the, 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 um, 
the Omicron variants, there are two plagues which are now in humans. They've gotten rid of the other coronaviruses. And so that's a whole other problem. We, we may, if we start vaccinating for influenza, this may cause what's called uh, neutralizing escape mutants, which basically means if you use a vaccine over and over, you'll get viruses that escape neutralization by the vaccine, and then they will become the predominant virus. And that's why in humans every year, um, you have to change the influenza viruses. Yeah. Now we're getting a quadrivalent vaccine. And that virus that we get is not only one from humans, but it it's comes uh, from birds and cattle. And so it's a mixture of a lot of different ones. And that's the whole another problem with the influenza viruses. They will infect and uh, cause recombination in other species. Last year, we saw a lot of coyotes and foxes, even uh, uh, sea animals, otters, um, the seals, uh, become infected and even die along the shorebirds. Never had that happen before. Yeah. So um, it's scary because um, is it endemic in wild uh, waterfowl? Probably is. And so what that means is that uh, we're going to have to do a, a better job of uh, keeping the wild birds within uh, five, ten miles away from the houses. And that's going to be difficult, you know, because that air can be yeah. sucked in. Oh, yeah. So it seems at least with like the historical data, it's kind of is it's in the waterfowl population and then their migration kind of pulls it around the world. Right. And then no it's question. gone into other populations that might eat those birds. Like I know there's been eagles and other raptors no that question. become infected because yes. of eating. Right. Yes. So it's it's moving to bird populations or animal populations likely consuming a, an infected bird. Would you say that? And some of these sea otters or some other animals yeah. that you wouldn't expect? <laughs> uh, no question. Um, this last year was the first year that we actually saw um, those kind of outbreaks in, uh, in, in vultures. And uh, we, could, we could see the same thing. I mean, you, you've got uh, coyotes, foxes eating those as well. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's a way in which the waterfowl are in the same small locality the, the sea, the sea birds with the seals and they're in mm -hmm. that same area and, and otters. And you can see how you could get infected in, in, uh, cross, crossover and spillover. Yeah. Oh, crossover. Yeah. Uh, it's, so, it's something that's not going to go away. I mean, the first yeah. outbreak in poultry was seen in like 1875 in, in somewhere <laughs> in Italy a long, long, long time ago. And yeah. that's where it got this, uh, it's an Italian name where it got, the in, game influenza came from influence, which came from fire, the way it spread. And there have been outbreaks that have crossed over in humans, uh, in the late 1900s in, um, in Southeast Asia. And there, there has been significant problems then in humans. And, uh, we, you know, we all have to think about that. Um, mm -hmm. the good news is we got good surveillance, um, you know, because people are getting influenza all the time. So, you know, they're doing sequences on those and looking mm -hmm. at poultry and looking at these other wild animals to get that information out, just like we did with coronavirus, share it, find out. Mm -hmm. You start vaccinating and we find out that we're getting some of these escape mutants, then uh, then they'll have to do it, uh, make these changes. Uh, but yeah, um, yeah it's, it's a whole new world. It's kind of a, a strange new world, something we have to continue to, to deal with. Um, Pharmaceutical companies are out there and they've got the vaccines. They just need the regulatory the companies to, to, um, to allow it. And there's dozens of com companies around the world, uh, countries around the world who actually started vaccinating them. They just, and they don't have the biosecurity that we do. Gosh, <laughs> it's, it's a big thing. Um, so as far as looking at how the vaccines might develop over time, do we have to continue looking at the same combination of hemagglutinin and, and neuraminidase, sorry, um, or are we always just going to kind of focus on H5N1 until we get those escape mutants like you're talking about? I mean, do we have to pay attention to both high and low path for a vaccine strategy? Well, the, the forests that have caused disease in poultry over the years are primarily H5, with some H7 and H9. Mm -hmm. But the H7s and H9s have not spread like we've seen before, and they've not gotten into the wildfowl. So, um, the, and they've been using in the areas where they have had that. In um, I think the Middle East has dealt with H9 for a long time. They just go ahead and vaccinate in the hatchery with the inactivated vaccine. 
They're not even using mm -hmm. the common vaccine. So uh, H5s are the, the problem that we've seen. And uh, this is the one that's crossed over into humans and all these other populations of animals. Yeah. So um, they're going to have to continue to isolate these and look at the clades to determine yeah. determine where they came from. I mean, yeah. the strain that we have now is a Eurasian. And you could see their charts out there that show how these wild free-flying uh, ducks and geese mainly from Asia and uh, from from Europe have come together in mainly uh, Alaska and northern Canada where they breed, and that's where you have the exchange of viruses. And then those birds then will, uh, those migratory birds will migrate all the way down into South America. And this is the first year that we've really seen, well, last year, that we've seen outbreaks in South America. Never saw them before. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and now one by one, they're starting to, to vaccinate. So the virus has changed. It's a whole new game now. And, uh, yeah, opened everyone's eyes, and so we'll we'll just have to see um, where we are on this. I think the U.S. is still probably two years away from uh, vaccinating, unless we have a really bad outbreak. Um, in in again in layers in um, uh, in the Midwest, the the World Animal Health Organization goes on this um, compartmentalization, meaning mm -hmm. that if you have a certain area. That, like in the U.S., which is huge, that it has outbreaks, then areas that are not within a hundred or thousand miles away from there should not be embargoed. You know, but some countries that they don't, they won't, they won't follow the world health. They will, they'll embargo the whole U.S. even though that it may be just in one state within the U.S. And that's yeah. The problem. So, do you think some of the uh, the lack of this the virus down in South America is due to climate? Because I I know it's assumed that once the weather warms up and there's less issues with ventilation and and being able to have drier air, that kind of helps the transmission of the flu. But do you think that is true, or do you think there's another maybe migratory reason why places in in South uh, America are less impacted? I think the virus uh, ha has uh, in the past had certain narrow um, windows as far as not only the temperature but the humidity and whatever that was didn't allow it to to replicate in like latin america and it may be that the birds that are migrating in latin america may be slightly different and mm -hmm. uh so uh i don't think no one no one really knows because you can do sequencing of mm -hmm. all these viruses and that'll that you tell you tell you the genomic but not the phenotypic or the functionality of the virus so um I think it's a combination of a lot of things. And, uh, but now that they, the virus is, has moved down there, there's no reason to say that it's going to go away. Yeah. I yeah. mean, uh, and you, you know, you have things that are moving around, shipping all the time. You know, we, we see that with influenza and we see, you know, people that go in our, our summers go down to the winter in, in, uh, Australia. They'll bring it back and they'll spread it even though it's in summertime here. So you can get influenza in the summer here. Yeah. As we saw with Omicron. So what what other interesting things do you think um are are challenges or opportunities for us as far as influenza goes? We've kind of improved biosecurity and response. Um so maybe the next step is just the the vaccine strategies and the politics. One, two, and three. <laughs> <laughs> One biosecurity, two vaccines, and three the political uh, geopolitical business, all that, all has to change. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think it depends on country to country. I mean, there are always going to be countries that um, they just, they, their biosecurity is just not there and they're going to have to vaccinate forever. They call it the new influenza. I mean, yeah. not the new Newcastle disease virus because we've been vaccinating against uh, very virulent pathogenic Newcastle disease virus that can kill uh, and is, uh, can kill as many birds and is, uh, can spread just like the influenza. But, uh, so they've been vaccinating against that and the U.S. have been vaccinating it. And they're saying, okay, well, we, since we vaccinated for instance influenza, uh, why, why should, why, sh or Newcastle, why should there should be a differentiation between Newcastle and influenza? If they're both highly pathogenic, they both can yeah. spread by, by wild free flying birds. What is the difference? Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> it, it must. It could be the human aspect of it because the Newcastle yeah. disease doesn't cause the disease in humans. Uh, oh, but um, yeah. so we'll we'll see. In fact, is the uh, influ uh, 
influenza the new Newcastle? And will countries then continue to vaccinate uh, for influenza just like they do for Newcastle? And there's no reason that we have an HBT uh, that Newcastle cloned into the HBT. So, I mean, you could add the influenza to it and get a free way. And that may be something that we might see, especially in some of these other, other countries that can't afford uh they, first off, they don't have the infrastructure to do testing. They don't have the infrastructure to do slaughtering. You can't do it. So, um, uh, you know, it, there, there, it, there's just so, there's so much, uh, you know, it's, it's the, to vaccinate or not to vaccinate. That is the question. You know, it's like, and it's going to be different. Every country, yeah. even within, even within a country. And so, um, every, everybody's got to weigh that. And, uh, I don't, I don't foresee a uniform vaccination around the world. Uh, mm-hmm. although, you know, it'd be nice if there was, but it, it could be, it could be two or three yeah. years from now. Every chicken in the world will get an HPT with an influenza climbed into it along with a new. Yeah. And that, that's what we could see. Uh, but there again, then you have to have it for the, the birds that aren't chickens, right? It won't work. Right. Their, so they'd yeah. have to have their own vaccine. Yeah. So why why do you think that is that some of these these virus um, these issues arise basically in one one poultry species but not another? Like why 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 doesn't that platform work in turkeys? Well, uh, viruses are, are species specific, and so right. just I mean there are lots of viruses that only affect chickens and don't affect turkeys. Those are for right. turkeys don't affect chickens, and that has to do again with the hemagglutinin. The structure of the hemagglutin, which is attaches to the to the cell membrane of the host, right? And just like with the coronaviruses, mm-hmm. that for a long time the coronaviruses that were out there in in animals didn't affect humans, but the hemagglutin went through these changes, uh, which allowed them to attach to to the um, the proteins on the uh, host cell. So I mean that in the changes, the virus changes the the the, uh, the the um, the influenza virus and the coronaviruses are RNA viruses, and the RNA viruses are mainly they're very human, they're very mutagenic because they lack the DNA pre pre uh, proofreading uh, enzyme, which means once they infect, they can continue to put mismatched bases in there, bases that they are shouldn't be there, and that then causes the changes. If you get them in the right places. The hemagglutinin is a fairly large uh, um, gene, but it has to be, the changes have to be in just a small area of that mm-hmm. hemagglutin, just like with the, the spike protein on, the, on the, the coronaviruses. So you can have a lot of changes in the hemagglutinin or the coronavirus spike gene, which do, which are, they don't affect the functionality of the virus, right? So um, I read one article that 10% of the gene, gene genomes in humans uh, are, came from viruses. They've, they've infected us and they're there forever. So, I mean, yeah. you can see, uh, and, you know, and, you know, people are looking at cancer and a lot of other diseases. Uh, did they come about through mutation of the, the viral genes in humans, which allowed some people to develop cancer or be infected or develop diseases that others don't? And there's a, there's a whole, it's a whole group of people that are the molecular based people that are looking at, uh, now that we can se- sequence the whole human genome and sequence all these viruses rapidly, you know, you can, it, it helps, it helps. There's a whole area of proteomics that you, that you yeah. just, I'm sure you're well aware of. I always find it creepy, the percentage of our bodies that are bacteria and viruses, because we think of ourselves as not, <laughs> not full of those things. <laughs> well, the micro microbiome is a kind of a buzzword of the last 10 years. Yeah. We're trying to show. And if, if you people go and sequence the bacteria in the gut of chickens, there are literally thousands of different bacteria and fungi, which are there all the time, but mm-hmm. they, they, they don't do anything. They don't have any yeah. effects on anything. They're just there. Yeah. But it's kind of neat reading those articles, but they're academic, right? Yeah. But it, oh, so, yeah. Somewhere or another, they're, they can cause disease. And I'm sure that there could be influences of the virus uh with bacteria with fungi and this gamish which is in the either in the intestinal tract or the respiratory tract so that triggers the change in pathogenicity or antigenicity oh, yeah. yeah so complex <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's the fun world of uh dna and rna yeah gosh 
I, when I was a postdoc, um, we had a guest lecture come in and they were talking about viral genomes. And I don't remember the exact number, but it, there's some billion numbers of viral particles in one mill of seawater. And so you go swimming and you're just thinking, I'm actually <laughs> bathing in viruses. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> you don't takes, want to think about it. <laughs> it takes millions to infect a person. Yes. One virus is not yeah. going to do anything because you got an immune. You have to have a certain viral load in order to have yeah. an infection. And that's millions. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I know that for the uh, the more infectious versions of the flu, it takes less for the the high pathogen versus the low pathogen, right? Yeah, do you do you happen to know what the scale of difference is? I don't know if anyone's quantified it. Uh, I I don't know, but what you can what you can do, you can do that study in chicken egg, eggs and cell cover. Mm. You can then determine the amount of viral particles in an uh, that you have, and then through through analysis through DNA, uh, and then determine what amount of viral particles it takes to infect an egg or to infect mm -hmm. a cell culture. So you know, yeah. that's what you're doing. In real time PCR, you can do those kinds of things. Yeah. Well, is there is there anything that we haven't chatted about in this uh, podcast that you wanted to cover that would be important for someone trying to understand the topic? Well, as I said, um, a lot's going to come out of the studies which are being done now in the Southeast mm -hmm. you know, Poultry Disease Research Facility. So they just started in May with the vaccines mm -hmm. which are out there. And I, they're going to have studies on uh, infection, immunity, challenge uh, mm -hmm. for a year maybe or more. Because mm -hmm. they're going to have to do these in different species of, of animals. They're going to have to do it over time. They're going to have to do different levels of challenge. I mean, these are going to get really complicated. How much, yeah. uh, how much virus, I mean, how much, uh, what dosage of vaccine? How can we distribute the vaccine? Uh, how long will the immunity last? I mean, there's just a myriad of, of uh, information that has to be dealt with and collected before they're ready to tell the, uh, the um, central vaccine um, biologics group whether we can vaccinate or whether we can know. And they're not going to release these vaccines until there's a lot, a lot of data. And, yeah. and of course, during that time, we'll, we'll know what these other countries have, have, have found yeah. out. But the virus is, a, it's a changing virus. And, you know, we continue yeah. to see that. Uh, I think the good thing is, I think with the humans, we're very, really, soon we'll be able to see mRNA vaccines with coronaviruses and influenza virus together the multiple mm -hmm. different viruses together in one shot. And that's what people want. And hopefully yeah. in the future, we'll get to do aerosol sprays. For those people who don't want to be injected, there'll be a spray yeah. that you can take, which will immunize you against all the coronavirus, all the influenza viruses, and, mm -hmm. and possibly have the same for chickens. As you said before, I mean, nothing will beat an ovo. I mean, because it's just a machine doing it. But will they need to boost? Will we have to boost? And can we boast by spray or, or water? I mean, uh, and, and I think in the future we, we may be able to get MRI vaccines that can be sprayed. And that would be the best yeah. thing. That are DIVA, that, that produce 100% immunity to mor morbidity, mortality, and do not allow virus shed. That, that would be the world. Uh, and I think yeah. we could do that. I think that could be the end of the embargo. And yeah. it would be the new Newcastle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that that'd be great if all of those conditions could be met. <laughs> I, I think we'll see it, but yeah. probably five years from now. Maybe. Yeah, take some time. It's gonna take yeah. some time. Uh, and in the meantime, there'll still be some uh, testing and slaughtering, unfortunately, and uh, maybe to the lesser extent. You know, I think we're better in, than we were last year, just like we were with uh, coronavirus. We won't see those. Last year, I think we lost. 48 million hens, another 10 million turkeys, and an un unknown number of wild flying birds. And yeah. If you look at that around the world, I think probably a half a billion uh, commercial per uh, poultry were euthanized or died. And so it's, you know, it's, how long can we do that? You know, and, yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, it is. But, but it yeah. was not, it was 2015 till we saw the last one of those. So, May, even if we do nothing, we might not see anything for another five or ten years. But I think we will do. I think we will continue. We ramped up. The, uh, the USDA has ramped up 
and the rest of the world uh, surveillance. So, yeah. you know, it would be shame on us if we, if we, we know it's coming and we don't do anything about it, you know. Yeah, so, uh, oh, I agree. <laughs> yeah, poultry are, are too important as a protein, food, and other source around the world to let this continue to happen. <laughs> no question. And, and to lose the wild free-flying birds and birds oh, and that yeah. are in danger. You know, who, who wants that? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, no, uh, I agree. that'll change the whole ecosystem. You know, we yeah. lose, we lost seals, otters, foxes, you know, coyotes. That would change the way the world lives. Yeah. 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 You, you forget yeah. about all the things that scavenge or consume the birds that would be yeah. sick. So it's really not worth, thinking, but worth losing biodiversity for a political yeah. embargo. <laughs> yeah. Well, no question about that. So, um, yeah. we, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think the next year to two will there be changes. What they are, yeah. who knows? Well, we'll see. It's time for our famous three. Your partner in improving animal performance, Berg and Schmidt. They believe the following additives are necessary in the poultry dietary. Functional lipids for an efficient dietary energy management. Phospholipids for emulsification, achieving a better nutrient intake. MCTs to provide energy and modulate the microflora within the intestines and enzymes for elevated use of fibrous materials and byproducts. Eastman serves veterinarians and nutritionists in agrochemical and animal health industries by helping them select, evaluate, and implement innovative nutritional programs. Eastman works with your team to customize your gut health approach in feed and water. Eastman's approach addresses nutritional and bacterial challenges and finds new ingredient preservation and hygiene solutions. Explore ways to accelerate and innovate your programs. Contact the animal nutrition team at eastman.com. Well, this, is, this has been really fun, so I want to wrap up the podcast with the uh -huh. three questions we ask everybody. Um, okay. The first, first question is, is, what is your favorite poultry-related book or resource? Well, um, as being involved in poultry health, I mean, most of the poultry health come from the AAAP, which is the American Association of Agents. They've got at least seven or eight different books from, uh, and, and with, C with CDs and DVDs that come with it from books that may, uh, they're not hardback that cost $150 on up to the diseases of poultry, which is over $300. Uh, you know, but for people who are not, in that, you know what I read every every uh, week. I read um, World Poultry and Watt Poultry publications because mm. they're so good and they keep you up to date. I mean, if you got a a poultry disease book that's three years old, it's, it's not going to keep you up to date because things are changing all the time. So uh, I I'd say those magazines and for most people, those magazines are free. I mean, yeah. you you can, if you especially if you're a professor. You can get all those free and uh, they're online. So they'll come yeah. to you. And so, and it's, uh, I mean, I even got those that get the ones that, uh, that are backyard. I'm, I'm really interested in chicken whisperer and all these, uh, different things <laughs> yeah. that you can get that are, they're really kind of neat. And, uh, yeah. I, I enjoy reading those 4 H material. There's just a lot of material, which is, I mean, there's a lot of people that are backyard enthusiasts. They just want 10 pens for their, daughter to show in 4-H or something, you know? And yeah. so that information is there. It's on the website. And, uh, you know, the internet has changed everything. So if you don't have the money to to buy a $300 book, then, you know, just get the information online. And, and, in, and for scientists and even industry people, going to the meetings, the local industry meetings, the state meetings, there's... Uh, Country meetings, there are international meetings. I mean, there are mm -hmm. just so many meetings that you can go regional, international, and get all that information, and that'll give you the latest information that you can, mainly from a scientific background. But um, you know, you, you you need to stay up if you're involved in any aspect of research or commercial poultry or at like a scientific area. Then you, then you need to get go to those meetings, get the books. And, and take online courses. There are online courses that are out there that you can take. The webinars like we're doing now, you know, podcast yeah. webinars, they're out there. And you can go on YouTube. <laughs> There's all kinds. I think the, web, the, uh, the webinars and podcasts are on YouTube. And you, you can learn so much from YouTube and professors giving talks and things. 
uh, and get that information. Some of it's good. Right? You have to read it with a grain of uh, salt because some of it yeah. may not be information that uh, may be yeah. you know, fake news. But uh, yeah, I. <laughs> To me, even though I'm retired, I'm still re I'm still going to scientific meetings, regional meetings, state meetings. Uh, I'm still getting the information and read it all the time. Uh, oh, yeah. There's an uh, egg industry um, weekly uh, article that comes out from my friend Simon Chain, and he gives you all the information you want to know about uh, from the business aspect of it. Uh, the, you know, how many hens are, or how many cage-free hens are out there, how many eggs are laying. Uh, what the cost of it is, and then he goes into diseases and things like that. So, oh yeah, I, I would uh, encourage people there to get on that one. Yeah, that's that's great info. Um, so, what is your favorite non-poultry resource or book that you've uh, read? <laughs> yeah, I mean, my wife and I are both of uh, we both subscribe to the um, the library, the Auburn Library, and oh. you can pretty much we can get any book that we want online ordered and it's there for us to pick up. We read it and turn it around. I'm into history books. I'm in oh. history classes. I'm taking yeah. all these uh, lifelong learning courses and in the lifelong learning courses, they, they, you know, they, you know, they encourage you to get a book, but you don't have to get one. And then mm -hmm. we go and once a, once a week we meet and go over the books. Um, uh, I've always been a history book buff, you know, especially yeah. the wars. And, yeah. and, and anything has to do with ancient history. My uh, my roots go back to uh, Rome, <laughs> ancient yeah. Rome. I have a family that can trace their roots back to um, to a small a small village outside of Naples. And uh, I'm actually the last name of my mother's goes back to to the country, the, the city that she came out of, which is founded by Octavian Caesar. So we go back that far. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it's amazing. So, uh, I, anything that has to do with history, I read it, but, um, yep. I encourage people that are retired to go get these online lifelong learning. I taught, you know, I taught yep. all the years, I taught students to get a lifelong learning, to keep doing it and keep abreast. I also am very much interested in investing. I spend a lot of time in investing, reading books yep. on investing and things like that. You know, you spend yep. your whole life making it. Now you want to hold on to it. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, uh, I get that there. Yeah. Um, so our, our last question is, is do you, what advice do you have for somebody to be successful in the poultry industry? I think you've already given quite a bit of good advice, but do you have any other additional? Well, and, 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 I, and I've said this before, I think on podcast before, um, find a mentor. And you know, for me, I had a mentor at the University of Delaware. I had one at the University of Georgia, and then I had one at Auburn. And also I have mentors which are, which are um, outside of my university. You know, find mm -hmm. mentors and learn from them and see somebody that's been at it for 30 or 40 years and how did they get to where they were and follow them mm -hmm. um, to, to see what they're publishing on, see what they're doing, uh, going to meetings. You learn something from them, you know, because – you know, otherwise you're trying to learn it by trial and error. And you can make a lot of mistakes. But if you see somebody who's been doing it for 30 years, they will help you. And they're always wanting to help you. You know, and I was on many committees just starting out as a new faculty member with the faculty mem faculty on that committee that were there 30 years. And they asked the kind of questions. I, I listened to them and, and look, look for the thoughtful questions that they were answering. And you can learn a lot by just, you know, listening to questions that other people. Mm. That have more knowledge than yeah. you, what those questions are. And uh, not so much always the answers, but the questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. Ask the right questions in life, and you'll, you'll get to, you, you'll just do a lot better. And you yeah. know, network with people, network with people that have common interests, and network work with people that are positive. There's enough oh, negative yeah. in the world, and just yeah. ease away from those people. And, uh, yeah. You know, and you know, you do that, and you pay attention to other people, and you and you volunteer to do things above and beyond what you're asked to do. It'll pay dividends, either within the university yeah. or with charitable things like that. You a lot, a lot to gain by helping other people more than what you put into it. Oh yeah. Well, this has been really fun chatting with you. I hope uh, the people listening have a better understanding of some of the the really complex climate behind avian influenza and vaccines, but 
I'm really happy to chat with you. You got a lot of good information that's that's up to date and really relevant. So thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it.